Okay, so uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, I mean, Vincent did a great job setting up our next talk, so that's uh, <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Gabby Rowe, uh, Executive Director of the ION, and you'll learn more about the ION, so I'll just leave it at that. Um, uh, prior to becoming the Executive Director of ION, she was the CEO and President of Station Houston. You'll hear more about Station Houston, I assume, during the talk, so I'll do all that there. But she's a serial entrepreneur, uh, spent most of her life maybe in New York, uh, roughly. And, but as soon as she discovered Houston, she just flew straight here and uh, not looking back. So, Gabby, thank go ahead. Thank you very much. <laughs> it took 48 years, but... Um, well, thank you so much, Jan, and thank you all for having me today, and um, the setup was absolutely perfect. So, one of the things that I spend much of my life talking about is facilitating communication, particularly communication necessary to solve really big problems. Um, as many of you, I'm sure, have experienced within your own companies, it's hard enough to do that within your own company, no less across interdisciplinary lines between different industry partners between different industries. Um, and yet that is the kind of collaboration that we're going to need to truly advance forward the solutions that we're looking for today. Um, what better place, in my opinion, to do that than the city of Houston? Unfortunately, though, there are a few things that we have to make sure that we do in order to accelerate that. So I'm gonna talk today a little bit about where Houston has been, where we're going, and then how we can use infrastructure, in particular the ION and the Innovation District, to help all of you continue to drive forward those solutions and to build the talent that was um, referred to in the last question. The there we go. So often when people think about technology, when um, I give this, these talks all over the country, the first thing that comes to mind are the technologies that are in their pockets. Um, and the technologies that we think of when we think about the transformation of our use of, of technology in our daily lives. Those logos are very familiar to all of you. Um, some of them have had a little bit of a bumpy road in the last six months, but they have very much defined what it means to develop a technology ecosystem, certainly here um, in the United States. And when we think of those tech ecosystems, we think of certain cities. San Francisco, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles. Very often, Houston does not appear on that list. That is something that we believe, and when I say we, I mean the people who live and work and drive forward uh, technological change here in Houston is something that we hope will evolve and change over time. But the reality is, Houston has had great innovation happen in our city for many years. Um, this is the place where we pioneered the artificial heart transplant, cardiothoracic surgery. We put men on the moon. We dug the, largest sh the longest ship channel in North America. And of course, when it comes to truly impactful growth in our GDP across the globe, there are very few innovations that have done that more effectively than fracking, which of course came right here from Houston. We also have incredible assets here in the city of Houston and have for quite some time. We have one of the highest averages of higher degrees, percentage of higher degrees in our population in the city of Houston. We have more Fortune 500 companies than any other city than New York. We are the most diverse city in the United States and that means that not one population or ethnic type dominates any other. No one has more than 50% here. We're truly diverse. We have the largest medical center in the world, four times larger than the next medical center, which is not even here in the United States. It's in China. We have more engineers per capita than any other city in the United States. And we are what I would call the traditional energy capital of the world and have been acknowledged to be that for quite some time. Some of those assets are particularly important when it comes to our historical ability to solve these big problems, like putting men on the moon or fracking. Diversity is one of those. And as I said earlier, not one, no one group dominates in the city of Houston. Um, I often use the, um, uh, the story of hidden figures uh, to describe this to people outside of Houston as a reference point. 
um, very germane in the last two weeks as, as we lost one of those mathematicians. Um, but these are three African American women who had a material role in making sure that we were able to land on the moon. As a New Yorker, 48 years in New York before it coming to Houston, I would argue that despite their talents, they would not have made it to a seat at the table in a city like New York. In Houston, they were not treated with equity and fairness. They were not acknowledged for their accomplishments. But they were given a seat at the table, because this is a place where when the wellhead blows, you roll up your sleeve and everybody gets together and fixes it. We solve problems in a very inclusive way based on who has the knowledge to get us to the other side. And that has been an essential part of our solving these big, complex problems. In fact, studies show that teams that are truly diverse and inclusive have a much higher likelihood to solve big, complex problems. And I would bet that all of you experience this in your workplace. Some diversity is more represented than others. As you can see, there is an overwhelming number of women in the room right now. <laughs> um, we have not succeeded in the energy industry in some of this diversity as well as we have succeeded in other areas. But it still remains one of the most diverse industries, and that has contributed to our ability to do things like develop fracking. And yet, when you look at us through that tech lens, we've done hideously bad. There's really no other way to say it. In 2015, which was when I first came to Houston, I looked around for a tech ecosystem. We had not grown in our venture capital investment in Houston for five years straight. Zero percentage increase. That means there was no pipeline of investment, there were no startup companies, there was no startup technology, and we were ranked at the very bottom of the heap in the United States. Cities like Newark, New Jersey were further ahead in tech ecosystem development than we were. And what did this mean for young technologists in Houston with ideas of ways to solve problems? It meant that the very first thing that they did was leave our city. Whether they went to Austin or they went to San Francisco or New York or Chicago or Oslo or Stavanger or somewhere else in the world where they could feel supported in their development, they didn't stay here in the city of Houston, which meant that the companies that were developing solutions in Houston did not have access to their ideas or their technology. Why, was, why didn't we have that infrastructure? Well, you may recognize all of these buildings as large energy headquarters located here in Houston. And traditionally, this is where our large corporations, our Fortune 500 companies existed in Houston, and quite frankly, still do today. You have to go through multiple layers of security. You are on an enclosed campus where you only meet the people that you work with on a daily basis, meaning they're in your department, they think the way you think, they work on the same set of unified one R&D that you do, no one questions it, no one pushes that envelope because that's not the way you are set up to work. This was very effective in a high-risk industry like energy. Because like medical in Houston, we have businesses where if you mess up, if you fail forward, as people like to say in Silicon Valley, people will die and you will lose hundreds of millions of dollars. And so the industry is set up to be able to protect that that doesn't happen, that you hold on to your handrail when you're walking down the stairs, that you put a cap on your coffee because you might be on a rig one day doing exactly the same thing, and if you mess up, something very bad could happen. That gets in the way, however, when you're trying to have those collisions, when you're trying to get people to share and cross-pollinate ideas, and really was a barrier in many ways for the city of Houston. I would argue still is today. Additionally, we were not doing a very good job taking care, taking advantage of the diversity in our community. And if you look today at the breakout of the tech jobs in Houston, they don't mirror the diversity of our city. And that was for several reasons. The first, because much of our diverse talent coming into the industries, biomedical, medical, or energy in Houston, were coming from somewhere else. One in four Houstonians was born in another country. 
It's one of our great assets. It's also one of our great challenges in terms of building up our own talent within this city. We also happen to have one of the worst public education systems in the country. It is um, well-renowned for doing a particularly bad job in sciences and in STEAM. It's very hard to build a cohort of talent moving up through our schools if they don't have any of the technical skills necessary to be able to take advantage or contribute to the development of an innovation economy. And yet, we have people in Houston working on some of the greatest, most complex challenges that face the world today. We are focused on resiliency as a city that is, um, has some challenges with flooding and climate change. We are focused on the use of our pools of data. We have two of the best, deepest, longest standing pools of data of any industries in the world. On the energy side, because we're incredibly protective of our IP and we won't share it with anybody and we'll keep it forever even if we don't want to use it. And on the medical side, we have HIPAA. We're going to keep it forever just in case somebody else sees it, but we're never going to share it with anybody else. So how do we then get over these incredible barriers so that Houston can play a relevant role in the development of not just a tech ecosystem here, but in the solving of these um, bigger problems? I think the first question we have to ask is, what are the, the problems that matter? And the way we're defining matter is about what does our talent care about? So what does everybody under the age of 40 think is most important that we have to solve in the world today? Because that's where the talent is going to gravitate. That's what they're going to focus on. That's where they're going to want to work. And these are fairly uniform across the globe. Equity and access, mobility and social justice, new forms of energy, carbon emissions and decarbonization, and many of those feed directly into the area that most talent wants to focus on, which is figuring out how to contend with the climate crisis. A year ago, this was a really, really hard conversation to have in Houston. Two years ago, you wouldn't go into Sarah Week or any other conference that was going on and even hear the word decarbonization. In fact, the Greater Houston Partnership had a committee on new energy where they had to change the original name because it had decarbonization in the title. Because that might make fossil fuels look bad. But we would argue that we know how to scale and solve really big problems here in Houston. So who's to say that decarbonization means fossil fuels go away? Who's to say that we don't use our relevant and important infrastructure to build solutions that are more widely applicable and hopefully global in application? Because where we've come to today is that one of two things are going to happen. Either we are going to be regulated into energy transition around this globe and Houston is going to be left to catch up, as will the companies of Houston, which we are already seeing in other parts of the world like Europe. Or we are going to take all of those phenomenal assets that we have here in Houston and we're going to build the infrastructure to support them to make sure that we lead, not just in energy transition, but in resiliency, smart cities, and in the development of the talent necessary to support that infrastructure. Because two years ago, a couple of things happened. And we realized that there were certain things that we needed to build in our infrastructure here in Houston. And the reason I use this slide, and I will put the caveat that for what I'm about to say, a robot is not a human being. Um, Every one of these pictures depicts a real circumstance of problem solving and collaboration in Houston today. Every one of these pictures depicts someone who is working on solving a big problem here in Houston. 
There is no picture where anyone is doing that by themselves. And most of those pictures involve people in multiple industries approaching the problem from different angles. But where is there a place where you can do that today? And how do you get past the challenges that have prevented us from getting there? Like protective IP, like a, a, a perceived lack of understanding. My, you won't get my problem, just like I won't get yours. And so two years ago, um, and remember, I said I'd started working on this in 2015, so we'd been at it for a while. By the time we got to this, two things happened. The first was Hurricane Harvey. And then three weeks after Hurricane Harvey, as we were trying to figure out how to get up off our knees, we found out that we hadn't made the long short list for the Amazon bid. There are a number of us who weren't particularly surprised that that took place. But the reality is, it was a great surprise to many powerful people in Houston who thought we have fabulous real estate, we have this great cost of living, what better place for an Amazon to come and build out their second headquarters? And what Amazon said to us was, you are missing the two most important ingredients that we believe are successful for innovation and for our company. And the first was talent, and the second was infrastructure. Well, we talked earlier about our DNA and what we have here as an asset, and we actually do have incredible talent. But, as I said earlier, that talent is coming from other places, not from within our city. And infrastructure, they couldn't have been more right. Because if you do, in fact, want to collaborate with someone else to solve a problem, other than coming to a conference like this or going to academic research facility, where do you go in Houston? It's this vast, sprawling place with these incredibly tightly secure companies where you don't even know who to call, no less what problems they're working on solving. So imagine being a startup technology who's come up with an incredible way to cap flares or particulate. Who do you call? You want to go talk to Exxon. You want to go talk to Total. Where do you start? How do you not get lost in that morass? Well, what you do is you pick up and you go somewhere else. And so all of us who were sitting around the proverbial table trying to figure out how to help Houston off its knees post Harvey started asking the question of, how do we solve that infrastructure problem? What do we need as a city to truly accelerate and truly transform the way in which we've innovated in the past? And um, the reason I use this slide is because um, Go back in time to 1939, even further back than the slide rolls. And who was the Amazon of the day? Who transformed retail? Any idea what that is on the, on the left-hand side or the right-hand side? The Sears catalog in 1939. And you could get anywhere in the United States, in your mailbox, in your post office box, in your mail um, facility in your tiny little town, you could get the Sears catalog anywhere where a package could be delivered, and you could order anything. You could even order a house, which you see up there in the top corner, and they would deliver it to you anywhere in the country. Completely transformed the every man's access to goods that they never knew were imaginable at prices that they could actually afford. Fast forward to today, what does that sound like? Completely transformed the way people shopped, the way they thought about retail, the way that companies were able to sell their goods. And in 1939, Sears decided to go beyond the catalog, actually in the early 30s, and they decided to open their first retail store for the everyman. Because department stores in, in, the, in the 1930s were the purview of the wealthy. They were in New York. They were in London. They were where the ladies who lunch went to try the newest perfume or get a scarf from Paris. They weren't where the everyman went to buy something for their kitchen or a suit because they were going to have a job interview or go to court. And so they picked the city of Houston for their first prototype store. The city of Houston in 1939 
was a frontier boomtown. And they built this, if you look at the streets, most of the streets surrounding it in Midtown were dirt. And suddenly they built this huge structure designed to sell goods to every frontier pioneer, farmer, rancher, oil man that would never be able to do that before. It was the first air-conditioned building in the city of Houston. It was the first escalators in the United States. I often compare it to the casino where they put you in a dark, cold structure and, and pump a lot of oxygen in. But this was Sears' test to see if this worked. And of course, they expanded that model very rapidly through the 1940s across America. What does that mean today in Houston? Well, as we think about this need to bring people together, to innovate, to get people to bump into one another, to get people to problem solve, we wanted to create a structure that almost forced that taking place, because we knew that this was very counterculture for the city of Houston, particularly counterculture for the industries of Houston. So these are pictures of what that structure and the area surrounding it will look like in about um, 10 months and two weeks. <laughs> but nobody's counting. Um, and we decided, and when I say we, I mean um, Rice University, those of us working on the ION project, that rather than doing what we typically do in Houston, which is to tear something down and build something again, we decided to build off of that history and really think about what is it about Houston that makes us uniquely suited to solve the problems that matter to the world. And it takes us right back to that wellhead. It takes us right back to the problem solving. Roll up your sleeves, get it done. It takes us back to those inclusive teams that people put together to develop solutions. So when I got to Houston five years ago, a lot of people kept saying, how do we become Silicon Valley? How do we become New York? Or how do we become Austin? And we could answer that question if we hadn't been successful ourselves, but the reality is we're incredibly successful economically as a city. So instead, the question we started asking is, how do we become a tech-enabled version of ourselves? And what that means is developing a physical structure, a center of gravity, where we can begin to create the counterculture that isn't going to work within an isolated campus for an isolated company. Because as I said earlier, the, the risk profile of the companies in Houston was come by honestly. To go into our energy headquarters and say, we're now going to have everybody just gather in open spaces together. We're going to share IP. We're going to fail forward and test things would disrupt an industry to the point where it would fail before solutions were developed. So what we wanted to develop was a space where those industry partners could come together to work on those solutions and also work with the tech talent that we wanted to attract to solve the problems we care about. So it's a six-story structure. Uh, it was originally a four-story structure that we're adding two stories on top of. It will be about 300,000 square feet when it's finished. And it is extremely open and accessible space to the point where for everything but the top floor, all amenities are shared. Any tenant who comes into the building does not have isolated restrooms, does not have isolated kitchens. They're all shared throughout the structure which is actually fairly commonplace in other cities and other industries. It's fairly radical when it comes to energy and biotech. And so on that bottom floor, we thought about where does it need to start? Where do we need to begin to stimulate the conversation and the talent? And so at the bottom floor, the lower level, there is a big forum stairs that terminates. It's got seating for about 500. There's a light well. See those yellow spaces that go all the way up? And you see cut on the left. There's a light well from the top of the building, because remember, as I said, they made it really dark and cold, so you'd stay there and shop. 
The challenge for that is that it was really dark. Um, in fact, it was a fallout shelter in the 1970s. So, so we cut a 30 foot by 90 foot hole in the ceiling to bring sunlight down to the bottom of those forum stairs. And on those forum stairs are conversations like these. But instead of having just high performance computing oil and gas professionals sitting in the audience together because you knew to sign up for this conf conference, we will have students from academia who will be wandering through and coming and sitting on those stairs. We will have professionals from biotech who will be coming through and sitting on those stairs. We will have many industries congregating and moving through the space who will hear a lecture going on and saying, oh, I didn't realize they were working on the same problem that I'm working on. I'm going to give that person a call. Or I, perhaps I'm standing next to that person at the cafeteria or the coffee line, and I say, I heard your speech this morning, and I wanted to ask you a question about something I'm working on that I think applies. So on that bottom floor, you have incubation of startup companies. That's where Station Houston, powered by Capital Factory, will be. We have a full XR lab for immersive reality and industrial testing that's going on into that floor. We also have the first public co-working of anywhere in the city of Houston that we are pioneering with the library department. So that Houstonians all over Houston can have access to this thing called co-working, not just in class A buildings that are being put in more affluent areas of the city. We're also going to be putting um, academic classrooms and workforce development classrooms. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we formed a group called the Academic Partner Network, and that is a network of the 11 schools uh, that are headquartered here in Houston. Um, that list of schools is now increasing on a Texas-wide and a national basis. Those schools have come together to develop collaborative programming that they can offer out of the ION, not just for their own students, but for industry partners who want to work on things like data science, but also for workforce development for our HISD schools and our other universities and two-year colleges here in Houston. The first floor is completely open to the public. Complete and open access to this building from anyone in the community that wants to come through. And on that floor will be a robotics lab that we are doing with NASA to focus on the interaction of human beings and robots. Houston Exponential will also have their headquarters there. There will also be a venture capital studio so that anyone who wants to invest in companies in Houston has a landing pad. And at that landing pad, they can meet startups from all over Houston. Because one of the greatest complaints we've had is when I come to Houston as a VC or an investor, I have no idea where to go. And if I were to go to each of the startup development organizations and hubs around the city, I would spend five days traveling and one day meeting startups. And so we're, we built a facility in this building where we will bring the startups to you, and you come as a VC, and you can have as many days as you want on a membership basis to set up your offices there. The next floor up is co-working specifically developed for tech startups. These floor plates are huge. They're 50,000 square feet, even with the light well. So there's room for 70 to 100 startups that are specifically focused on the tech that we need to solve industry problems that will be located on that floor. Two to 20 employees and their offices will be month to month and fully furnished so that they can easily come and go from the facility as they grow and develop. We don't currently have this in the city of Houston. We have small pieces of it in different areas, but we don't have it in a place where industry can access it. So if you decide that you have a problem that you'd like to find out if there's startup technology to solve, you have to now go to 32 different startup development organizations and not have one hub in order to find that. That makes the process much longer. The floor above that is going to be innovation labs and accelerators. And these are the places where corporate partners will be bringing their data science and innovation labs in order to focus on the problems that they are trying to solve within their organization, but that they want to be able to partner with others in other industries, in other companies to be able to solve. Probably the most culturally transformative part of the building, it's also interestingly been the easiest part of the building for us to fill. Because many of your companies 
started innovation labs over the course of the three, last three years. I consulted on a whole bunch of them. They're beautiful. They cost a fortune. Not a whole lot of focus on impact, as you said earlier, but a lot of focus on where's the pool table going to go and where are people going to get to hang out. Our, we encourage companies to focus on what problems are you trying to solve. And we're setting up innovation labs with them to enable them to do that while still protecting their IP and still protecting their companies. And then above that are two floors for growth startups and for large tech companies to come to Houston. We need unicorns in Houston if we're really going to drive forward our tech ecosystem. And that means we need startup companies that are founded here that grow to more than a billion dollars. We have our first homegrown unicorn that was announced about two weeks ago, High Radius. Our hope is that within the next two years, we'll have at least another six to 10 that will grow. We need to make sure that they have a focal point that they can rest as well before they have to build a building of their own. The commercial real estate industry in Houston is having a hard time facing cha challenge, the challenges of development and change as well. We want to be able to create structures so that those companies can move into a growth facility and only sign a one-year lease or a two-year lease. So if they go from 500 people to 2,000 people in 12 to 24 months, which if they were in California, they would, we have the ability to accommodate that here in the city of Houston. And that's one of the reasons why when Rice decided to steward this project, they decided, first of all, to go at it by themselves, investing $100 million at the outset in retooling and rebuilding the ION, the old Sears building. There was no incentives pledged to them from the city or state to do that. There was no debt taken on in doing it. There was no pledge of a joint venture. That was a pure contribution from the endowment of Rice University so that this could happen fast. Additionally, they bought up another 12 acres of undeveloped land right around the ION to create a walkable district. Because the other thing that talent has told us is they don't want to own cars. They want mass transit. We don't have a lot of mass transit in the city of Houston. The red line happens to be one of the most efficient pieces of mass transit we have, which runs up and down the innovation corridor and stops right in front of the ION. So Rice is committed to taking that 16 acres and building 30% residential, building, making a commitment to a lower 40 of each building that is entirely permeable to the public, either through restaurants or shops or open plazas, and committing to green parks and publicly accessible spaces to bring people from the local community into what tech innovation means in the city of Houston. We believe that the only way we're going to transform Houston's culture of innovation, historical cultural innovation, which is highly siloed and highly secretive, is to build the kind of space that will force Houston's innovators and force Houston's companies and enable Houston's talent to drive forward that material change. And in January 2021, I look forward to seeing all of you there and welcoming many professionals from many different industries to come to the ION to solve the problems that matter the most. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. We have one up here. So. Hi, Gavin. Um, so there's the Canon and there's mm -hmm. Station Houston and now you. Um, what, how do you differentiate? How do you collaborate? I mean, everybody wants to start their little thing in their corner and is there some merit in making it bigger and citywide? Well, um, the Canon and Station are both startup development organizations, which means they work directly with startups to provide mentorship for them, to help them grow their companies, or, um, or fail fast, whichever is most appropriate. Um, the ION is a hub. Uh, we will have no fewer than four or five accelerators in the building. 
we will have at least two to three incubators. And every startup development organization in Houston will have the option to have a representation or a hub there. Um, it is not meant to be a place where everything happens. It's a place to drive change. Uh, there will be 15 to 1,700 events in the first year. 99% of those events will be open to the public. And they'll be open to the public in an incredibly open and public space so that we can drive those collisions. Because the challenge with the startup development organizations by themselves is that there's a lot of pre-filtering that goes on as to who goes to those. So yes, you have representative logos of lots of different companies there and maybe one or two people, but you don't have significant presence. The purpose of this facility is not to simply drive forward a startup technology. It is to drive forward the innovation economy for the city of Houston in an accelerated fashion so that we can leapfrog to the two coasts. And, and the number I use to sort of put that into perspective for people is um, the state of Texas. So all of the major cities of Texas together last year generated about $4 billion in venture capital investment. The state of California generated $77 billion. The state of New York generated $44 billion. We have the industrial base to at least meet, if not exceed, those investments if we are leveraging technology for our companies. That's our goal. That's what we're targeting. We need all of those startup development organizations to be knitted together with academia, with industry, and then with investment capital from around the globe. Additional questions? Oh, there's one over here and then one in the middle. Good morning, Gabby. Good morning. My name is Yara Dekalu. I'm um, both an entrepreneur and intrapreneur recently at uh, Enbridge's uh, Innovation Lab. Mm -hmm. It's the first time I've seen a comprehensive plan for the ION, and I, I have to say I'm, I'm really impressed, and I'm looking Thank forward you. to uh, the, the opening. Uh, as a startup entrepreneur, though, I, I see the many phases that this needs to uh, roll out, and I want to understand from your perspective, what are the one or two things that you have to nail within the first year to, I guess I would say, get a cascade of adoption to happen at the ION? Well, I think the, the, that's two, there's two phases to that and, and two important components. Um, the first is um, partnership of experts. Um, this building has never been tried before anywhere, certainly not in the United States. I, I won't speak to the globe because I haven't been to every place and I did see something like it in Beijing. but. Um, it's not happened anywhere in the United States. There are pieces of it that have happened before, but nobody's tried to do all of it together. The only way we can accomplish that is to make sure that it is a collaborative partnership of experts. So for the last year and through all of this year, we've been working to assemble those experts together with the common goal of creating this, this place, this center of gravity or nucleus or whatever you want to put with it that no one has ever done before. And, and we've been really blessed in our ability to do that, both um, on the academic side, on the industry side, and then of course, um, you know, the startup development side was probably the easiest one for us to bring those experts to the table. We've been able to do that on a national level um, so that we could really bring in experts as opposed to just bringing in Houstonians. And I think Houstonians are fabulous, but this is something we've never been done before, so we needed people who had done it before. The second piece of that is making sure people show up. And um, I did an exercise with my, my own team about a month and a half ago, sort of what could go wrong, which everybody, you know, sort of we dove into that abyss very quickly. Um, the biggest what could go wrong that everyone shared is you walk into that building on day one and it's empty. And um, that is probably our most important um, hurdle we have to cross because the experts will help us make sure that it's activated. The experts will make sure that we're creating impact and delivering value to the many different constituents that are coming into the building. We need to make sure that they show up and they engage in a really profound and sticky way. Everything we do between now and opening in January is focused on that, and quite frankly, that will probably be the majority of our focus in, in year one. Addison. Good morning. Good morning. 
Uh, my name is Addison Snell. I'm with Intersect 360 Research. That was a really compelling presentation. Thank you very much. And as industry analysts, we, we do a lot of looking at medium range and long term uh, industry trends. What was really compelling about your presentation was that you're looking at some grand challenge types of problems that'll have very long-term impact. I'll ask a related question, which is short-term related. I'm kind of looking at more medium term. Mm -hmm. We've, we're at the start of this decade, right? So let's say you run this through a decade. We come back here and it's 2030. What would like a 10-year success look like for this? Because I don't think we get to a lot of the real grand mm -hmm. challenge things you're talking about in 10 years. What would be a 10-year success for the ION? Well, I think the, the biggest 10-year success for us, which we view as a near-term and medium-term challenge, is talent. Um, that, that Houston, what about talent? Um, that we actually have talent within Houston that stays in Houston. So we actually graduate more high school students in Houston than any other city save Los Angeles. Um, we export the overwhelming majority of that talent, especially the best and brightest of our talent, to other parts of the country, often to the two coasts. Um, in 10 years ago, from now, if we've succeeded, we will be the city of choice for young talent here in Houston and in the other major cities producing talent across the country and across the globe. That's success number one. Success number two is that in driving toward those big problems, which are aspirational and long-term, we will have already solved a, 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 a majority of the small problems we bump into along the way. We will have moved the needle such that Houston is perceived, this is connected to talent too, that is perceived in the world outside Houston as the place to be if you want to drive forward material change, particularly in the area of energy transition. You know, our, our hope that is in three years we are identified as the energy transition capital of the world. Our hope in 10 years is that we are identified as the new energy capital of the world. Thank you. We have one uh, final question there. Uh, so Bob Ekshafei from Aqua Energy. Uh, we are a startup uh, in Houston, and uh, we were one of the members of Station Houston. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I want to just thank first uh, for what you're doing for the city because the last two years we have seen from close like how rapidly this has uh, grown. Uh, my question is uh, regarding the Halo Fund. So mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to uh, ask you what's the relationship with uh, Halo Fund and ION? So uh, is the there, Texas they, Halo Fund? Yes. Are they going to work together or? Um, totally yeah, the Halo Fund is one of the groups that we're working with in the in the venture capital studio. Um, we believe very strongly that Texas money gets Texas and is loyal to Texas, um, it, much more so than, than money from other parts of the world. But we also believe that one of our uh, most important and imperative missions is to bring capital from other places, uh, which really means giving the Texas Halo Fund a run for its money. And if we do that, then, then we will have succeeded. And that's true of Han and some of the other organizations that have really been essential to startups in Houston today. But the more competition they get, the better it's going to be for startups. And um, we're starting to see glimmers of that. The Houston Exponential um, Fund of Funds has played a material role in getting people to look at Houston. Um, to the question before, our job now is to make that look sticky and make them come back and make them invest. And we're seeing more term sheets. Uh, month by month. But to your point, two years ago, the idea of the ION didn't even exist. So we have, we have covered significant ground in a really short period of time, but, but that's what we do best in the city of Houston and in the state of Texas. We, we know how to scale, we know how to grow, um, and we know how to do it in a way that's sustainable for the long term. I'm going to ask one closing question. I'll give you an opportunity to, what's your ask of this community for the next 10 months and two weeks? Um, I um, would love to see you all get out of this room and show up at the ION for programming that you think has absolutely nothing to do with what you're working on. Um, come and listen. Come engage. Maybe it's not on energy. Maybe it's on smart cities. Maybe it's on diversity in small businesses. Maybe it's on tech and communities. Show up, get to know the other people who are thinking about innovation outside of the energy sector, and then we're really going to be able to build that interdisciplinary problem solving. The greatest challenge we have is having people 
lift their heads enough to say that I have to pay attention because the change matters. And it doesn't just matter to me, but it matters to all the problems that I and my teams are trying to solve. And if any of you would like to bring a group to visit the ION, to talk about what we're doing. So I, I often give these talks and people walk up to me and say, I, you know, there's five people back at the shop that I would love to, to hear about the ION. Um, just let myself know, let Jan know, um, and we will set it up to do that. We do it for companies uh, multiple times a week because the more people who know that this thing called the ION is coming to exist, um, the more they will engage and participate. Let's thank uh, Gabby. Thank you very much. Thank you.